Are we ready? Nama o Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutali Srimati Bhakti Vinanta Swamini Tinamini Namaste Sarasati Devi Guruvani Pracharine Nirvise Sasunyavadi Paskatya Desitarine Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Sidveta Gudadha Sri Vasudhi Gaur Bhaktivindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So you have to excuse me. Uh, I've been very busy uh, about concerned with uh, the disappearance of Bhakti Chiru Maharaj and speaking about him every day. So today we're going to continue our uh, classes uh, based on our desire to support education for uh, our youth and I haven't uh, I'm not going to go over the homework uh, that you had for last week uh, we're going to give have a short class today and then tomorrow we'll have a, a much longer class um, and today I want to talk about Prabhupada's view of science and why he started the Bhakti Vedanta Institute and uh, I want to analyze Prabhupada's rational uh, let's say deductive uh, process uh, using the starting point of Vedic knowledge to ascertain what is the truth in science as well as in, in general. So, Prabhupada chose Bhakti Sarup Damodar Maharaj as the, uh, the uh, leader or uh, the uh, director of the Bhakti Vedanta Institute uh, for scientific preaching. And he wrote him a letter on 17th of December, 1975, that's very, very important. And we're going to analyze this letter and the points that Mahaprabhu Prabhupada makes to show what is s spiritual deductive reasoning by which one can ascertain what the truth is and be able to have an alternative to the science, scientists, modern scientists and philosophers so-called rational scientific approach to knowledge. And one second. So did you get an email just now from Guru? Okay. All right. So this is a letter, December 17, 1975. And Prabhupada writes, My dear Swarup Damodar Prabhu, Please accept my blessings. I beg to acknowledge receipt of your letter dated November 29th, 1975. I have noted the contents carefully. Your book is selling very nicely in South India. People are appreciating it very much. This scientific book should be done very carefully so that people in general may not be misled by the over-intelligent scientists. There are so many contradictory things, but we have our authority and they have their authority. So right away Prabhupada is saying that what he's implying here is there are many contradictions between the Vedic point of view and the so-called modern scientists and philosophers point of view. And first of all, he's appreciating the book that Bhakti Chiru, uh, Bhakti, I'm sorry, Bhakti uh, Swarup Damodar Maharaj wrote. And uh, it's a wonderful little booklet. In fact, I will send you or show you where you can s see a copy of that book and read it. It's not a long book, but it's very, very well done. And Prabhupada appreciated it very much. So he says, this scientific book should be done very carefully so that people in general may not be misled by the over-intelligent scientists. 
There are so many contradictory things, but we have our authority, and they, ha they have their authority. <laughs> our knowledge is from Vedic scriptures, which we accept as definite and without any mistake. A modern scientist believes that there was no civilization before 3,000 years. Our Bhagavatam was spoken by Sukadeva Goswami 5,000 years ago, and he is explaining, as I, as I have heard it from authority. So we have got parampara system for millions of years. If there was no civilization before 3,000 years, then how this subject matter of knowledge could be discussed? How could it be received through the parampara system? So there is contradiction, certainly. Contradiction between the Vedic point of view and the modern scientist's point of view. But the statement that there was no civilization 3,000 years ago can be adjusted by the conviction that there was civilization millions and millions of years ago. So uh, maybe this term, maybe this number 3,000 years ago may not be uh, correct, but what Prabhupada is saying is absolutely correct, that there was Vedic civilization millions and millions of years ago. For more information regarding Vedic astronomy, you can consult my learned, any learned astronomer there. There are many in Calcutta. My Guru Maharaja was also very learned in this field. Okay, so now comes the main part of this letter. Prabhupada says, my point is, life comes from life. They say, meaning the scientists, life comes from chemicals. So how can these things, how can, so how these things can be adjusted? So that's a question mark. I mean, he's implying that, you know, you're not going to find a common ground with the modern scientists. They're saying something that's, they're adamant about that life comes from chemicals, and we know that life comes from life. Prabhupada says, besides that, the scientists change their theories after some years. This proves that they have no perfect knowledge. Otherwise, where is the necessity of changing? That is the basic point of our argument. In other words, our point, Prabhupada's point, the Vaishnava point of view, that is that uh, perfect knowledge is never changeable. So if you have perfect knowledge, you're not going to be constantly changing it, revising it, correcting it, etc. And the scientists, that's all they do. They continually come up with new theories and they throw out the old theories, or they have to correct the new th their theories. And Prabhupada says, this proves that they have no perfect knowledge. Otherwise, where is the necessity of changing? That is the basic point of our argument. Perfect knowledge is never changeable. If we can prove that life comes from life, or the soul is from the super soul, then all other things can be brought into serious condition, consideration. Now, there's everything else that we're saying uh, based on Vedic knowledge will also be accepted. If we can just make this one point uh, that life comes from life or that the soul is coming from the super soul and life does not come from chemicals or material elements combining together in different ways. So you try to prove that chemical combina combination can never bring about life. This is our main argument. This is the main argument for convincing the modern scientists that their technique is bogus, their theories are bogus, their knowledge is not perfect because they're always changing it or revising it 
or throwing out one theory, bringing in another theory. If we can prove this particular subject, that the soul cannot be manufactured by combination of chemicals, then gradually we can prove that Vedic knowledge is perfect, while other sources of knowledge by speculation and imagination are all wrong. So, this is a major point, right? This was, he was, he was outlining the main argument that we have and that should be set forward to the whole world through the Bhaktivedanta Institute, that it's impossible to produce life through uh, combination of, of matter or chemicals. The only way is through uh, the Vedic process of deductive, uh, of uh, spiritual deductive knowledge. The other day, Prabhupada continues, I was talking on the morning walk about the sun globe. They say because it is a fire, it is fiery, there cannot be any life there. But sometimes we see a big iron factory is full of flames from the chimney at a long distance. But does it mean there is no life in the factory? Fire is one of the five material elements. And Bhagavad Gita says that the soul is never burnt by fire. So in the sun globe, if the living entities have a fiery body, just as fish have a body suitable for living in the water, so how is it that there is no living entity in the sun globe if they have a body suitable to live in the sun globe? This is a rhetorical question. He's, he, the answer is evident. So, now, how did he, how did he develop this, uh, you would say, explanation? It's developed on uh, the uh, spiritual deductive reasoning, starting from Vedic knowledge. So let's look at this a little more closely. And this is what you would call a perfect example of how devotees understand things. It's, it's, they begin with the uh, statements of Krishna in Bhagavad Gita. So, what statement is Prabhupada using? He says, Bhagavad Gita, second chapter, 23rd verse, Nainam chindanti sastrani, nainam dahati pavakaha, lachenyam kudayantyapu, nasosayati marutaha. So he says, the soul can never be cut to pieces by any weapon, nor burned by fire, nor moistened by water, nor withered by the wind. So, he said that... First, he gives an example to begin his uh, argument. He says, they say because the sun is a fiery planet, there cannot be any life there. Now, first point that he makes is, but sometimes we see a big iron factory is full of flames from the chimney at a long distance. But does it mean there is no life in the factory? So this is a, an excellent example based on Prabhupada's personal experience. There, there previously and maybe even today also you'll see in uh, places where there are uh, where there are uh, storage tanks of uh, of petroleum, or where there are uh, factories where they produce steel. And uh, and he says that you see you can often see flames coming from the chimney at a long distance, so that means there must be fire going on in that factory. But does it mean there is no life in the factory? No. Uh, if you go into the 
steel factory where there's these tremendously hot, uh, gigantic ovens that are melting metals and combining different metals to make alloys. But yet there are plenty of people in that factory, although there's unbearable heat in these ovens, un incredibly high heat. <clears throat> so, uh, but does it mean that there's no life in the factory? No. And then he says, fire is one of the five material elements. Yeah, bumir apo nalo vayu, kam manor, budir evacha. So that is one of the five, the, the earth, water, fire, air, and ether. And Bhagavad Gita says that the soul is never burnt by fire. Well, yes, it says that Nainam Dahati Pavakaha. That means that the soul uh, is, is never burned by fire. Okay, so second chapter, 23rd verse. So then, so in the sun globe, if the living entities have a fiery body, well, everybody's body is made of these five elements. Bumir, Apo, Nalo, Vayu, Kamanu, Buddha, Evacha. But depending on the planet and depending on the atmosphere of that planet, there can be different combinations of these five elements for the material material body of the living entities living on that planet. So, fish have a particular body uh, for living underwater. We see that. And also, there are certain types of germs that live in fire, and they're living entities. So, Prabhupada says, fire is one of the five material elements, and Bhagavad Gita says that the soul is never burnt by fire. So, in the sun globe, if, if, the living entities have a fiery body, just as fish have body suitable for living in the water. So how is it that there is no living entity in the sun globe if they have a body suitable to live in the sun globe? In the Vedic literatures, it is said that there are germs called agni poke within the fire. There are so many contradictions, but we have our own defense. So. There may be so many contradictions between the explanation of the material scientists and the Vedic literature, but Prabhupada says, we have our own defense. And he just showed how we, how we can defend ourselves against the arguments of the scientists using logic and reason or a deductive uh, process starting from the a priori truths or the self-evident truths of the Vedic literature. In other words, Bhagavad Gita are direct statements by Krishna. And he's and and if we deduct based on Krishna's uh, self evident uh, truths that he speaks in Bhagavad Gita, we can defend ourselves against the scientists. Now this is an example. He he begins with an example from his own practical experience, seeing fire in the chimney of a steel plant or a uh, a place where they uh, keep uh, oil, uh, etc. From a distance, you'll see fire coming from the chimney. Does that mean there are no living entities in that factory? No. No, there are plenty of people in the factory, even though in a steel factory, etc., where there's tremendous heat being generated in gigantic ovens, but yet there are hundreds of people working in such factories. And then... Uh, fire is one of the material elements. And in Bhagavad Gita says the soul is never burnt by fire. And then Prabhupada's next point is, so in a sun globe, if the living entities have a fiery body, just as fish have bodies suitable for living in the water, so how is it that there is no living entity in the sun globe if they have a body suitable to live in the sun globe? So Prabhupada uses his own experience, he sees that in this world, fish can live underwater. Human beings can't. Fish have a body to live 
underwater. Human beings don't have a body to live underwater. Therefore, if they stay underwater, they have to have a, uh, a special uh, suit on, etc. But, but with their own body, they cannot s stay permanently underwater or for a long time underwater. So, uh, so he has an example from observation of nature and from explanations in the, in the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam that there are living entities these have bodies that can live underwater. And not only that, he learn, he, he, he's giving an example in the Bhagavatam it says there are living entities that actually live in fire, such as the Agnipok germs. So, here Prabhupada uses what we call spiritual deductive reasoning. And there are examples in, in, on this planet that supports that spiritual deductive reasoning. That is, that in different environments, Krishna has made different types of bodies to live. So, there are five fundamental elements, but on the earth, people that live above water on the earth, they have bodies that are suitable for that environment. So, therefore, uh, uh, the human body is made of mostly water and earth, and a little bit of fire and air. Whereas on the sun, the body, and, then, and then also there's mind intelligence. And on the sun, uh, most uh, the bodies are mostly made of the fire element with very little uh, earth, air, and water. And on the moon, the bodies are made mainly of the mind and very little earth, water, air, and fire. So you see, by the adjustment of the uh, five elements, it's possible to have uh, living entities have material bodies on all kinds of different environments, from the sun globe to the moon globe, underwater, on the earth, in the air, on earth, in fire, on earth, etc. So there are many, so many contradictions between the scientific, the, the material scientist's speculative method of authority and the devotee's reliance on Vedic authority. Now, Prabhupada says, why should we blindly accept imperfect scientists? They're imperfect because they are changing their position in the name of progress. The word progress is used when there is imperfection at the beginning. Ah, what a major point that is. Their so-called uh, plea of progress is actually a, simply a validation or, or proof that they have incomplete knowledge because they have to always change their theories with, as they find newer and newer information. The word progress is used when there is imperfection at the beginning. So this regular changing of standard knowledge in the name of progress proves that they are always imperfect. It is a fact that they are imperfect because they gather knowledge with imperfect senses. At any rate, so now again, Prabhupada is bringing up another point of Vedic knowledge, that is that every living entity has four defects. They make mistakes, they're easily illusioned, they have imperfect senses, and they have a cheating propensity. So this, so one of the one he's pointing to is the imperfect senses. Therefore, their knowledge will always be imperfect due to the imperfect senses or the imperfect uh, senses for gathering knowledge or information. It is a fact that they are imperfect because they gather knowledge with imperfect senses. At any rate, we cannot deviate from the Vedic knowledge. Okay, so there you are. Uh, this is a letter written on December 17, 1975. Your homework is to look up this letter 
read it carefully, especially the parts that I just went over, and take a look at what you may be learning in your science books. It may be about uh, Darwinism, it may be about the Big Bang, it may be um, life comes from chemicals, um, and maybe other things that I don't know about that you you may be reading in your science books in, in the elementary school and middle school or high school. And then see if you can use the Vedic knowledge, use spiritual deductive reasoning from Vedic knowledge to counter their theory. They, of course, only have theories. We have perfect knowledge because the Vedas are unchanging. They don't, they're, they're not engaged in this progressive movement, always correcting the theory or throwing one theory out, bringing in a new theory. So, it's not only your science books, it can be in uh, anthropology book, it can be in social studies book, it can be in, in, in a series of different books that you may be reading in which there are theories brought forward by the scientists, the social scientists, the political scientists, the uh, uh, material scientists, etc. I see if you can find some of these theories, just like uh, Prabhupada uh, is talking about the sun and the fact that scientists say there's no life on the sun or uh, scientists say that life comes from chemicals right or uh, scientists say that uh, uh, we're engaged in a process of uh, what you call progressive process. This word progressive is often used in politics and social sciences and in other sciences. But actually it's proof that they have imperfect knowledge. The starting point is imperfect, therefore they have to always be correcting. And But they call it progress. Actually it's not progress. It's, it's uh, one speculation based on another speculation based on another speculation. So, try and find some other points that are controversial between Vedas and, and science. Like, for example, uh, if you read the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, it says that the moon is, is 20 times bigger than the sun and much uh, over one, at least one million miles farther away than the sun. Now, Scientists say that they went to the moon and it's the closest planet to the earth. It's closer than the sun. So there's another contradiction between the Vedic science and uh, the material science. And there are others, like for example, uh, scientists or anthropologists say that there was no civilized uh, culture uh, more than three or five or 10,000 years ago. But yet the Haiti culture is the most civilized culture and it's been around millions of years. There's another uh, contradiction. So there are many contradictions between the modern progressive speculative theories of the scientists and philosophers and the Vedic knowledge. So your homework is Look at your own science books, look at your own history books, look at your own uh, social science books or anthropology books and see if you can extract different uh, difference, uh, di differences between the theories of the scientists and the Vedic knowledge. And then use spiritual deductive reasoning to defend the Vedic knowledge against the material scientist point of view.
that's your homework. Uh, and uh, if you have difficulty doing it, you can ask me uh, to help you a little bit, give you some direction to point to. Are there any questions right now that you would like to ask about what we just read? So this letter is written on the 17th of December, 1975, to Swarup Damodar. Prabhu, actually, he became a Maharaj. So we're going to, at 10.30, a uh, very dear friend of mine named Guru Garunga Prabhu is going to speak about Bhakti Chiru Maharaj and uh, and then tomorrow also Ramai, uh, His Holiness Ramai Swami and uh, His Holiness Shesha Prabhu are going to speak also about uh, Bhakti Chiru Maharaj. They will speak tomorrow at five o'clock, and Guru Garanga Prabhu is going to speak in the next fifteen minutes, ten thirty. He's a very good friend of mine, and uh, he would he he's the person that helped most significantly save the New York Temple from being sold, and uh, he's a lawyer. And uh, he joined uh, Krishna Consciousness early on, around 1972. Uh, and he's done a lot of significant service for Srila Prabhupada over the years. No questions? Okay. So we'll stop right there. And tomorrow I'll go over your homework that you did in the uh, for last week and uh, and we'll go forward and hopefully you'll do this homework today for tomorrow thank you Hare Krishna all glories to Srila Prabhupada